Let's have everybody stand together as we, uh, we worship. It's really good to see you guys today. <coughs> so as uh, we we'll open with a prayer, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the gift of worship and the gift of fellowship that we can be here today and just bask in your presence and just to give you our best worship, Father. And I just pray that we have an encounter with you. I just pray that our hearts, that you put your words on them, Father. We just want to be a people today. Just want to be a people. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let 
the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Just the voices, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. I never know whether the mic is on or off. Well, welcome to Discovery Fellowship this morning. Uh, glad you could join us for this morning's worship and service. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If everyone, anyone hears my voice, I will come in and sup with them and they with me. And I think worship is that. It's our opportunity to ask him to join us in our presence. So it gives us an opportunity to worship him, to glorify him, and thank him for all the things that he has done in our life. So again, welcome. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for today. We thank you for our ability to be here. We thank you for the chance that you have given us to worship you. So we thank you, we glorify you, and we ask you to bless this service in your name. Amen. Would you stand with us again so we continue on in worship? the outer course and through the holy place past the brazen altar Lord I want to see your face pass me by the crowds of people the priests who sing their praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness and it's only found in one place Take me in to the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take the cold, touch my lips, here I am. courts and through the holy place past the brazen altar lord i want to see your face pass me by the crowds of people the priests who sing their praise i hunger and thirst for your righteousness and it's only found in one place Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the cold, touch my lips.
the outer courts and through the holy place past the brazen altar lord i want to see your face pass me by the crowds of people the priests who sing their praise i hunger and thirst for your righteousness and it's only found in one place take me into the holy of holies take me in by the blood of the As we were praying this morning, there was a prayer blast that Jesus let us tug on your heartstrings. And Jesus' heart is so big that his string reaches out to every and each one of us. And it's by the Spirit's power and the Spirit's might and it is his will to love us where we are at. Jesus' heart is the lifeline that gives us that place to hold on to. And as the darkness tries to come in, Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes all I can do is grab onto that lifeline. And even though I'm from afraid of letting go, he says, just hold on. Just hold on. He loves us today. He loves us every day. So if you're holding on to something, hold on to that lifeline. Because it won't pull away. He is the anchor. He is the anchor. to worship you. Lord, we don't need, we, oh, we don't always need words on a screen to praise you, Lord. So right now, in, can we do something? Can we do something? Can we just go inward into our hearts and can we just reflect on one aspect of who God is and why you are thankful for him? for your presence and your continual faithfulness in my life. I know it feels a little uncomfortable and if you're new here this morning then we're just kind of crazy about Jesus so we just want to tell him how good he is but can we just out loud this morning begin to thank him? It doesn't have to be loud but just out from our own lips just let's thank God for even if it's one thing. Just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for whatever it is. Don't think about anyone around you. before the Lord. So let's just offer him the realness of our hearts right now. You are real, God, and you are real in my life. In the dark, you are my light. Just thank him. Don't wait for anyone else. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are my light. You are
worship, Lord God, this morning. Stir up in our soul's praise because you are worthy, Lord God. And we do not serve a religion. We don't serve things and relics, Lord. We serve a living God, and you live inside of us. And you are real, and you are here now. And that song, take me to the holy of holies and take the coal, cleanse my lips, that's from Isaiah. But you are that same God. And you desire to fire, put fire upon our our lips with a passion and passionate love for you, God. And Lord, I just want to pray right now for anyone. We're just, we're just going. We're just going. We're going right now. I just pray for anyone right now who needs passion for the Lord in their life relit. If that's you, just put your hands up before the Lord right now. If you want a new fire and a new passion, new passionate love for God this morning just put your hands up to him and say lord here i am fill me with passionate love for you and lord we pray we we pray pour out your love upon us god no labels no denomination no nothing just jesus just the living god from the living word you are real and you are holy and you are coming with passionate love and devotion for us god and that we in turn give back to you, Lord Jesus. We love you, God. 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 We love you you for your presence. Your word says, Lord, that you are not looking for words. You are looking for a heart after you. Your eyes search to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for a heart that will truly be yours. And Lord, we are yours. We offer you our hearts, God. We are thankful for you and your presence, God. We ask for more, Lord. You are awesome in this place. You are awesome and mighty in this place. You are awesome in this place.
is passionate about you this morning. Way more than you can imagine. We're going to continue in worship and take communion this morning. And I'm going to have the ushers come in just a moment to, to pass out the elements. And uh, what I'd ask you to do, if you just hold on to those elements, the, the bread and the cup, for just a moment. And, uh, and I'll give some instruction in just a minute. Let's sing that one more time. There we go. Consider the depths that God did to reach us. I was thinking about this last week with our men's group. We were talking, and I was, we're Galatians, and I was just, it, it hit me the, the depth that God has gone to reach us. It is because the lowest moment of history that God was able to reach you and I this morning. He didn't reach us from the heavenlies, shouting forth across the bow with a trumpet. He reached us at his lowest moment, suffering upon a cross. That's an amazing thing. He said, how far would God go 
to get your attention? How far has God gotten to get your attention? How far has he stretched his sacrifice, his energy, his passion? When we consider that, it's absolutely astronomical in thought that the God of the universe, the creator of everything that there is, the one that set the stars. Do you know the scientists still haven't examined how many galaxies there are? They're up in the billions. We can't even see past really clearly our own galaxy, and yet they're saying there are billions of galaxies. That every star that you see out there is like a billion stars brought together. The vastness of the creator of the world saw fit to reach a piece of dirt that he breathed life into in you and me. The Bible says that he created you. He formed you in his own image. And he lost you. He lost each of us to sin. He lost us to a world that separated. He said, how far would he go to redeem that creation? Jesus says, I went this much, this far. It's been said, theologians said that one drop of his blood would have been enough. He could have walked up to the cross, poked his finger, and one drop of blood would have been enough. But he gave it all. And we look and say, well, what what brings us here today? What brings us into this relationship with the mighty God? It isn't from the heavenlies, it's from the lowest place. That's why the disciples couldn't gra- fathom what he was getting ready to do. He told them, he says, you know what, I'm going I'm to be taken away. I'm going to be put to death. And after three days, I'm going to rise again. And Peter goes, no, 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 no. That, that, that's, not the, that's not the God that I serve, not the God that's going to die and be put to death. No, no. We've seen your miracles. We've seen you raise the dead. And that doesn't make sense. Jesus said, unless I go, unless I do this, I cannot fulfill my Father's business, my Father's will. You hold in your hands this morning two elements. A piece of unleavened bread, which means there's no yeast, and a cup. And those two things represent the most powerful point of history. Do you know the greatest moment in all of history was when Jesus raised from the dead? That is the greatest moment of all earth's history, all the world's history. The second greatest moment is when he died on the cross. Both those events, those three days, changed everything. The Bible says that there is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but through me. And the ground before the cross is level. There is no other way to the heaven. There's no other way to eternity than through the cross. And for us, it's important that we take time to remember that. Amen? That we take time to reflect on that. And so he... It says the night before he was betrayed, he had supper with his disciples. We know that was a four-hour Seder meal, that he was revealing himself as the Messiah. (coughs) All the things they didn't understand. In a part of the meal, he picked up the bread, the matzah. It was in a, I can't remember the name of it, but it it was in a napkin. Three pieces of matzah. And he pulls out the middle piece and he breaks it in half. They did that every year. They didn't understand what that was. And he put one back in, and he pulled up. But that night, he told his disciples, let me explain this to you. These three pieces of matzah, they represent the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. And he reaches in, and he grabs the middle one, and he breaks it, and he says, this is me. This is my body. And the disciples were looking at this matzah, and they couldn't see the propheticness of it at that moment. But it was, it was unleavened. There was no yeast in it. It was perfect. It was, it was pure. 
It had holes, piercings throughout of it and stripes throughout of it. It wasn't until later that they went back to Isaiah 51 and they, or 53 and they said, by his stripes we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. They began to put the pieces together. But he picked up the bread and he said, this is my body and it's broken. Just break that piece of bread that's in your hand. Just hold on and break that. You need healing? Don't eat it yet. You need healing? You need, you need healing this morning? I want to tell you something. We talked last week that healing is part of the atonement. It is part of the atonement. His provision is part of the atonement. His, his deliverance is part of the atonement. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? He wants to set us free, amen? If you're not free this morning, I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and I want you just to agree with this prayer. That Jesus would set you free today. That he would heal you today. Receive what he has. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you came and you paid the price that we could not pay. And we thank you that you allowed your body to be broken for us. And I declare healing, restoration, and deliverance upon each person that's here today. If there's someone here that's dealing with a physical element, a sickness or disease, we just take authority over right now and ask Jesus, as we partake of this communion, we just receive all that you have, the first fruits of what you have for us. In Jesus' name, let's partake of the bread together. Likewise, Jesus took the third cup, which was the cup of redemption in the meal, the Seder meal. He, he actually, I've said this many times, but he did something strange. You have 12 men sitting in a room with him, and he proposed to them. Literally proposed. You know, you ever been somewhere and seen somebody propose to someone? Usually they get down on one knee pull out a ring, say, would you marry me? Jewish tradition wasn't that way. Jewish tradition was that the groom, if he was going to propose to a bride, he would actually, in the presence of the father, he would pour a cup of wine. And in Hebrew tradition, is the, the bride would actually pick up the cup and drink it, and that was her way of saying, I will, or I do. So all of a sudden, Jesus is in this Seder meal, done, and all of a sudden, he changes up to everything. He and in fact, what he quotes isn't even from the Seder. He quotes is from the wedding feast. This is my cup. This is my blood, which is a covenant for you. That was part of the wedding feast. So basically, the Hebrews are sitting there going, wait a minute, Peter. Did you hear what he just said? Matthew, did, did he just propose to us? That had to have been an awkward moment for them, an incredibly awkward moment. But we know that Jesus is coming back for a bride. Amen? He is the ultimate groom. He's coming back for a bride. They still had to catch up. You know, you don't have to be perfect to take communion. I grew up, there's a lot of confusion around communion. People say, well, I'm not a part of the, I'm not a, I don't belong to the church. It doesn't matter. Well, but there's sin in my life. Ah. The Bible says we don't take it irreverently. I've had a lot of people say, well, I know where I was this week, so I'm not going to take communion. Let me tell you something. Communion is that moment where we come in confession to Christ and we say, okay, Lord, here is where I am take my sin, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. In this moment, we immediately say, Lord, that's why I'm here. It's to be made righteous in you. Amen? Father God, I thank you for your blood that was shed. There's no more incredible, there is no product on this planet that can wash away our sins. No Ajax, no, Ajax, no Comet that can scrub away our past. But Father, your blood covers over all of us. It covers over all of our past, all of our trespasses, all of our transgressions, and all of our iniquities. And we thank you for that. And as this cup represents your blood, as it represents what you've already done and what you're doing in our lives, we just confess to you. We align our confessions with you this morning. And we say, Lord, expose everything into the light and make us clean in Jesus' name.
Let's partake of the cup together. Let's sing that again, if we could. From the top. Yeah. 
coffee and refreshments in the back. You can go ahead and help yourself too. Brother, I appreciate you, man. I really do. I really do. Like, you know, like that. Or like, there's something that works better off of someone like a might bounce like a Super Bowl.
my voice is uh, not the greatest today. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, once again, we want to welcome you guys all to Discovery Fellowship. We're glad you're here this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you're a visitor, uh, you we're not expecting you to give anything today, but please just take a look in the bulletin. Find out all we have to offer you. And also we have a newsletter that you can find on our, our Discovery Fellowship app on our website, uh, and it's free to download to the iPhones and Android phones. That has much more information than even in the bulletin. So if you have any questions, uh, we also have the office schedule and everything in the bulletin as well. And uh, we have a tithing envelope right here. You can use this for tithes and offerings as well as putting money in for the conferences we have coming up, like the men's conference is coming up soon. And so just put your monies in here and fill out the information that's needed so we know where that money is supposed to go. So first, I just want to make sure everyone has a bulletin. So go, go ahead and raise your hand if you, have, if you don't have a bulletin yet. And we'll make sure one of the ushers give you one. Good. Looks like everybody has one. That's good. All right. Um, we also have a Discover card. So on this, you can fill out your information, especially if you've already given us your information, but you might have changed your phone number or email address. Please uh, update us. Uh, that is how we are able to stay in contact with you, uh, but you don't have to. We just enjoy staying in contact with you during the week, especially if we have men's and ladies stuff going on that you guys are a part of. We won't be able to get update you with that information unless we, we have that. Okay, so the next thing is uh, had is happening Fridays at 7 p.m. Right downstairs in the, dis uh, in the kids' room that you guys saw this morning is also where they meet for had. That's an addictions group, support group. So I encourage everybody to be a part of that and join that if you're having any struggles. Ladies uh, movie night is happening May 4th, and that is going to be at 6 p.m. We're going to meet right here in the sanctuary. It's uh, a really awesome movie called Only God Can, and um, it's about a bunch of ladies going through many different life uh, struggles, and God just miraculously comes in for them, and uh, it's an awesome movie. So I, I encourage you guys to find that uh, preview video and take a look at that. We'll be showing that in, in about two weeks. Right now, I want to go ahead and show you the men's conference video, and then I'll go over the details of that. It, it looks something like this. I'm not just here to tell you he's got a way for you, that he has a purpose for you, a promise for you, that he's the mediator, the in-between, God and us. Even if you're sinking because you took your eyes off Jesus, he wants to reach out if you would just do one thing. Lord, save me. I began to grow and to learn and to, to meditate and to pray and suddenly my faith actually began to grow. I began to not be crushed by my adversity, but I began to use my adversity. God didn't abandon me in the storm, but he was right there, present the whole time. I just couldn't see. That looks like an awesome time y'all are going to have. How many men are going to the conference this year? Awesome. The registration, the $75 people that have signed up to want to go, they need that registration, the $75 today. So please use the tithing envelope, fill that out, and get the $75 in today. The rest of the amount can, uh, can be paid towards the week of the conference. Also, we have a kettle corn booth uh, that is going to be down at the Kitsap Harbor Fest, May 26th and 27th. They need leaders and helpers. So please touch base with a uh, pastor or the church office. Let them know that you are interested. They need help this year. That is one of the fundraisers we do for the church. It's very important and they need uh, some people to lead that this year. So please pray about that and see what God would have you do. It's uh, really important for all of us to be a part of that in some way. Uh, I also want to uh, give a quick note. The men's breakfast is happening next Saturday. So there's always an awesome breakfast. Uh, next Saturday uh, at 9 a.m. is the 
men's breakfast, May, sorry, April uh, 28th. <laughs> sorry. So I'm just getting my dates mixed up. So anyway, just go ahead and uh, fill out your Discover card. Let them know that you want to go to that. And uh, we uh, once again just want to thank you for being a part of our service today. Thank you. All right. We're going to do communion at this time. I mean, offering. Sorry. It's one of those days. We had two memorial services last yesterday and kind of threw me for a loop. Um, one thing about offering that I've learned is that God doesn't need it. He doesn't need the money. He can do all things without it. It's our heart the way we perceive it and we give. Over the years, I always used to do the pay all the bills and do everything first and then tithe out of what was left. Until about 15 years ago when I realized that it needs to be first and he'll supply all our needs. And he's done it. Now, if you're a visitor here, we're not asking you to give. Just enjoy the service. But in Malachi, he says, test us. The Lord is the only time he tests us. And I don't know how many times I can't count them. He has provided everything that I need. Not want, need. There's a difference. And so this is uh, your opportunity to give back what he has given you. And it's your heart. It's what your, is in your heart is what he's looking for. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, it's with a thankful heart that we appreciate you. Your grace, you go into the cross, you sacrificing everything for us and giving us an opportunity to sacrifice a little for you. We thank you. We glorify you and we praise you. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. We switched up the schedule a little bit. I think I threw, threw everybody off. I, uh, <coughs> I, am, uh, I have been praying this weekend that God would uh, so manifest himself in our midst uh, with regards to the message today. So I don't know. Um, Kirk, you're back there. So if you could grab some bulletins. Does anybody need a bulletin? Did not get one? Everybody have notes. There's notes in the bulletin. Otherwise, you can go on our church app on your tablet or phone and uh, follow suit with that. Looks like we're all good. Thank you, Kirk. Appreciate that, buddy. So if I could get you to stand, I want to read. Uh, we are going through the book of Acts this year, kind of working through this. And I'd like to read uh, Acts chapter 8. We're in Acts chapter 8. It is in your notes uh, today. And uh, you can follow along beginning of verse 14. And I'm just going to read 14 through 19. So let's just, uh, so somebody might need notes in the back there so we can make that happen. There's extra notes in the back table. So it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, 
They had simply been baptized into the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given and to lay on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability that everyone whom, whom I lay hands, I might receive the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we just uh, invite your presence into our hearts and to our lives today. Lord, when we come into a church service, it's different than going into a ball game or going into a, a classroom because we are interactively inviting you into, in and through us. We're inviting your word into the very essence, the very fabric of our being. We are connecting the spirit man that is in us with your spirit and asking God for you to, to manifest the logos of your word to bring it alive and make it rhema into our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the, the history, the document of the word that has been written that we might be able to glean from the early church and from, uh, from your message and your gospel and your good news. And we ask, Lord, that you would make it alive for us today in Jesus' name. And most of all, Lord, I pray that you just reveal your Holy Spirit, God, as part of the Trinity, that you would reveal that into us today as a people, as believers, as followers of you. And, and Lord, we just ask, Lord, we invite you in the fullness of all that you are into us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So in chapter 7, we just kind of came out. Stephen, one of the deacons, was, was martyred, and he was, he, was, uh, he was stoned to death for his faith. And that brought incredible fear into the body that was of Christians that had found Christ in Jerusalem. So those two or 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 that had gotten saved that found Christ from the day of Pentecost on forward have now, they, they decide, hey, it's not safe. And so they all kind of scatter. They kind of take off and they go out through, through, uh, through the, 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 uh, the entourage of what's there. They kind of take off and scatter. It says, except for the apostles, they all kind of left. And so the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And, uh, and they left. And Philip, one of the deacons, uh, not Philip the apostle, but one of the deacons, he, he, he moves towards Samaria. Now, Samaria was a, they were half-breeds of Jews. Uh, Samaria was a community that was not accepted into the 12 tribes because they had married outside of the Jewish faith. It was a lot of discrimination that was there. There was a lot of uh, uh, discrimination within the Jewish realm at that time. And they had not yet fully connected the fact that God was, came for all men, for all nations, all colors, all languages, all nationalities. They thought they just came for the Jews. And, uh, but Philip goes to Samaria, which is, actually fulfills Jesus' prophetic word in Acts chapter 1 when he said, stay in Jerusalem, and then when the power comes upon you, I want you to go to Samaria and Judea and the other ends of the earth. And so here, they're kind of going there. They kind of maybe thought they were going to go there out of intention. Well, uh, we're packing up next week, and we're moving to Florida. You know, it, it wasn't quite like that at all. It was, it, was, it was, they were packing up because they were afraid of what was happening, not realizing, God, where are you? Not realizing that they were fulfilling the prophetic word of being scattered. Sometimes negative things happen, and God is kind of in the underground of moving that towards where we need to be and what we need to be doing. But uh, Philip gets to Samaria, and he starts preaching. This deacon becomes an evangelist. He's he's sharing the message of Christ to those in Samaria and the message of the gospel, and they're getting saved. I mean, they're they're coming to listen to him. And there was a guy there, probably high intelligence. He was kind of the David Copperfield, if you will, of the time of the day. He was a magician, a sorcerer. He may have even worked as far as into the the dark arts and... and, um, and he, had, he, he would do magic tricks. And, um, you know, today it would be kind of like card tricks. But he, he would do magic tricks and illusions and, and things. To, that, and it, he would grab great crowds of people. And, uh, and he was pretty popular. He had a name. Probably had posters up with his name on it on Friday nights. You know, come see me. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Philip shows up. And he starts doing these miracles that aren't magic. But he's doing these incredible miracles. People are getting delivered. And they're getting healed. And they're getting set free. And he's amazed by this. And so all of a sudden, he, he, he takes a break, and he starts following Philip around, and he hears the gospel, and he, he says that he, he embraces the gospel. He becomes a follower, if you will. And, uh, and so he's kind of hanging out, and now he's kind of given up his livelihood. Um, 
and trying to figure out where he's going to go. I, we had a guy uh, not n- too many years ago. Um, we had a family in the church, and the, um, and the couple that was coming, they weren't married at the time. They were coming, but uh, on a Friday night, my wife and I took them to dinner, and they had about four kids together, and we were, we were talking at dinner, and, um, and, and actually, they received Christ on a Friday night. Both of them gave their heart to Christ. And I didn't really know the background, but the, uh, the one guy was actually a gangster. He was in back, he was in a, his background was gang, gang and, and drug dealers. We had a few guys come in here that uh, have been drug dealers. And I know uh, one Fred, he came in. And I remember two years after he was here, I asked him, he says, well, I was a drug dealer. I said, well, when did you stop doing drugs? He says, the day I showed up to church, I stopped doing drugs. I'm like, are you kidding me? Two years ago. It's like, wow, okay, that's cool. Well, this one guy, he, he had gotten saved, and, and uh, we started working with him, and I was having him, I, he was working on my yard at home, and uh, he, he called me one day, he says, can we get together? And so I said, sure. So we, uh, we met over at McLeod's, they had lunch then, and we had lunch, and we're talking, and, and he looked at me, he said, pastor, he says, I gotta be honest with you. He said, he said since Jesus has come into my life, he says, I've, I've decided, I gotta go to work. He says, my only problem is, the only thing I know is selling drugs. And he says, I don't want to go back to do what I was doing. He said, what am I going to do? And so we had this incredible ministry. The Holy Spirit showed up in that meeting. In fact, so much so, that's why I'm in the East Bremerton Rotary. The owner of McLeod saw that meeting and was kind of moved by everything and came and invited me into the Rotary at that time. But uh, I looked, I said, I said, you know, we began to pray that God would break that. What are you going to do? You get saved. Tony knows what that's like. He used to be a drug dealer and con artist and the whole thing. Come to Christ. Now what are you going to do? And you had to find a new, had to find a new, uh, new career choice to kind of move into, didn't you? And, and, uh, and so it's kind of exciting because this guy now works full time for Watkins Furniture in Bainbridge Island. And uh, God has done a whole lot. They had to move up there. But, uh, but here's Simon, the sorcerer. You know, what do you know? He, he, he did what he did. So what does he do? He gets saved. Now what's he going to do? So he's still trying to figure out his... I was going to eat and kind of figure this out. And all of a sudden, the news gets back to Jerusalem that, that God is moving. There's a revival in Samaria. That Philip is having this incredible move and these people are getting saved. And so John, they send John and, uh, Peter and John down to Samaria to kind of check it out, to kind of witness what's going on. And as soon as they get there, they start praying for these people. And it says, as they laid hands on them, they're receiving the Holy Spirit, what we call the infilling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's an evidence that's coming out of that that's immediate. It doesn't say here what that evidence is, but it, it, there's something. There's a connection. They lay hands, they pray, and boom, it's power. And it's, it's, uh, it's visible enough that Simon sees this and goes, ooh, I want that. And so he, tells, he, he comes to him and says, listen, how can I buy this? Uh, can I buy this? I want to be able to lay hands on people and have them do the same thing. And, and kind of his true colors come, and we see this, uh, this word of knowledge come over, a word of wisdom come over Peter, and he looks at him and says, dude, uh, you, you're in trouble. This is, uh, you, can't, you can't buy God, and uh, your heart is in the wrong place. There's bitterness. He starts calling out stuff in his life. And we see in the end here, we'll talk about that, kind of the result of what happens there. But this movement of the Holy Spirit was, was taking place. Now, a lot of people have claimed, well, they, they understand when we were in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Uh, that was the day in Exodus when Moses it was celebrated, when Moses brought down the word of God from the mountain. And now in the day of Pentecost, they see this, this incredible 120 of them up in an upper room and this rushing wind comes through and all of a sudden tongues of fire lay on them and, and they get drunk in the spirit. And it's just this incredible event that is there. And there are many who say, well, that's the only time. That was only for that moment. The problem with that is we see five more events in Acts where they are going. In fact, as far as Acts chapter 19, uh, which, which is in your notes, we see Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey uh, walk in and they run into these 12 dudes that have found Christ. They've been baptized into Jesus. And they ask them, they say, have you, ha- have you, heard, you, know, have you received the Holy Spirit? Like, what does that mean? They've, they're Christians. They have found Christ. But they haven't, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we haven't even heard of a Holy Spirit. And it says they laid hands on them, and we see immediately the response of that was they started speaking in tongues. And so that is where the Assemblies of God, when they had the revival back in the early 1900s in Azusa Street, that is where they kind of came down and solidified the tongues being the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a situation that gets kind of confused in the church, because over the years, different, different backgrounds have had different views on tongues and on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People get confused on what that is. But I will tell you this, it, it, it's not 
Um, some would try to tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not going to heaven. And I, and I think that's a lie from the pit uh, because it's not true. Uh, tongues is a free gift. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a free gift. It's one of the gifts that are listed in, uh, in, in Corinthians. And it's, it's something that's very available to us as, as a believers. And so I want to break down in, to you this morning the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit in our lives kind of as it related because this is something that's very significant, even in the other church, and I believe is for today. And I, I would, you know, as I talked last week about the atonement and healing that is part of the atonement, um, I think it's difficult for us to argue the point that where we're going to go into the New Testament and we're going to say this is for today, but this is not. And it kind of doesn't work that way. We either bring all of it or none of it. And so if, if, if something's there, then it all comes. We don't get to pick and choose which comes and which doesn't. And so, um, you know, I can tell you from my own experience, walking in the gifts of the Spirit, walking in the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, walking in some of these things, and healing and deliverance of some of these things are today. The, the gifts of the New Testament church are for today. Those are relevant for us. They're for you. They're available for you. You don't have to have a degree or, 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 or join a specific church. Those are, if you have Christ in your life, if he, is, if he is the Lord and Savior of your life, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, at that point, these gifts are available for you to flow and to have your being in. And I think it's important to grasp that. So one of the things I just want to mention here is, number one in your notes, the Holy Spirit is a free gift. The Holy Spirit is a free gift. It's not a command, it's a free gift. It's available to the believer. It's available to you if you've asked Christ into your life. It's something that is very much available as a gift. It's not something that God will ever force. He will never force anything on you. He didn't force salvation on us. He gives us the option of salvation. That's why, that's why you say, well, how can God allow the world to be where it is? And those people shaking their fists in his face saying, I hate you by the way they live their lives and, and deny him. It's because God has given us free will. And he's never going to force his way into your life. Some people get angry. Why don't you? I need, I need a kick in the pants every once in a while, right? But God says, listen, I'm, I'm a gentleman, and his, his spirit is a gentleman. And he, he, he is waiting for us to, uh, to respond to what he has. And just as salvation is a free gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit or what is being defined here as them receiving the Holy Spirit is also a free gift. It's this endowment of the Spirit being saturated in the Spirit of God that opens the doors for the giftings to flow. And it's, it's, a, it's a free gift. It's not something you can earn or buy or sell or, 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 uh, or determine. It's, just, it's, 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 it's something that's set up and is free. And that's what we see actually in Acts chapter 19. And I have this in there when uh, Paul uh, and Silas were in, in Ephesus and they basically said, have you received it? And they said, no, we don't even heard of it. It says they laid hands on them and immediately they received that. And I think that's, that's a powerful uh, thing to know. So if you're here this morning and you've not, uh, you've not experienced or encountered the Holy Spirit in your, in your faith walk, Maybe you've encountered Jesus, you've asked him to come into your life, and you've been walking with him faithfully, and God is very proud of you, and he loves you. But you say, you know, you've not had that experience. Uh, I just encourage you to keep an open mind to that, because it is in Scripture, and it's something that we have to wrestle with that is there. We can't just kind of throw it away. Now, in Acts, there's like, uh, I think, seven encounters of, of people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit that are actually evidenced. Of the seven encounters, five of those says they spoke in tongues. Two of those, which is one of those passages in chapter 8 here, it doesn't say what they saw or what, what the evidence was. Now, we also don't believe that there's only one evidence. There are many evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Boldness. In fact, Acts chapter t uh, 4 and 30 somewhere, it says that they, they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in the Word of God in boldness and boldly. So we know boldness is also... Some people who are very meek uh, and, and very timid and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden there's this dynamic of boldness that can come out of their lives. And that is also an evidence of the Holy Spirit. But for the most part, we've kind of, what we see in scripture is tongues is the initial. It seems to be the initial one. When I worked for the 700 Club as a counselor back in college, uh, we, we were told, and we had our, our sheets, and we were told if somebody prayed the prayer to receive the baptism of the Spirit, tell them they received it. And I struggled with that only for this one point, is if there was no evidence to determine they received it, and I told them they received it, could I be, and, and, and they haven't received it, could I, could I be leading them astray? And I'm like, man, I, I think, you know, at least, you know, receive it until there's an evidence of it, you know, that is there. And so, um, and there are a, a lot of groups that basically hold that, you know, tongues, you don't have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit. 
And I'm not here to argue for or against that. I think it's just that is one of the clear evidences that are there. And as the assemblies of God have held, that's an initial physical evidence that grabs a hold of. But it is a free gift. It's not something we earn. It's not, and it does not uh, make you more spiritual. Um, but although it doesn't make you more spiritual, number two, the Holy Spirit is a spiritual gift. It's, it, is, it is something that God gives forth as a spiritual gift. And um, we see Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, and 12 really deals with the gifts of the Spirit uh, as a chapter, but he says, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant with what's available for you. Um, I actually pastored, before I came here, I was in Tacoma. Uh, I was actually a youth pastor at a large African-American church. And, um, and I had about 180 kids that I was trying to pull the white kids and the black kids together and make sense of everything. And a lot of them were inner city kids. And uh, my pastor that was there, uh, my, my youth room was actually a converted tavern. Uh, our children's center was a converted pornography store. Uh, it was an inner city building. We had a Safeway that we had converted into the main sanctuary. And um, it was pretty, pretty impressive what they had done as a whole there. In fact, the Marvin Center down here, we built one at that church that's similar to that uh, right, right over um, one of the centers we have. And they have something that's very similar to Marvin Center in Tacoma. And uh, we, uh, we basically... Uh, um, my pastor that was there, he was a Baptist. It was a Baptist background church. And uh, he had been in this church, and he was getting beat up in ministry spiritually from a spiritual, uh, just beat up. And, and the enemy was just attacking him. He wasn't ready for a lot of the spiritual warfare that he was facing in the inner city. And it wasn't until he was in his room one day, he was in the living room, and he was praying, and all of a sudden, um, the infilling of the Holy Spirit kind of just showed up. And all of a sudden, as he's praying, all of a sudden he realized he's praying in tongues. And this Baptist became a Bapticostal, is what he called himself. That's kind of what Bill, Pastor Bill Cundiff, called himself. He was, a, he was a Baptist that got saved and ordained in the Baptist church, but then he got filled with the Spirit, and so he called himself a Bapticostal. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many people have flows in the area of, uh, of, of the giftings. Billy Graham was a Pentecostal in that sense. He did speak in tongues in his prayer language. It was there. A lot of people didn't know that, but a lot of people have flown in their faith. It's, it's a free gift that they can walk into. Does that make sense? And so, but it's also a spiritual gift that is, that is there. And so Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I want you to have this. And so he breaks down in verses 4 through 11. He said there are different kinds of gifts. This is 1 Corinthians 12, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works in all of them and all men. Now to each one is the manifestation of the spirit given for the common good. So God says, listen, these gifts are here and they're for the common good. They're for the body. So a lot of these gifts that we talk about that are in filling are for the body. The Holy Spirit being in your life is kind of the basis that opens the doors to those gifts. So when you've been, when you've been infilled with the Holy Spirit in your life, you've opened the door for those gifts to flow in and through you. And so whether it's the word of knowledge or the or, or, or workings of miracles or working of deliverance, all these different gifts, they kind of they kind of go hand in hand with that. And so so once you have that encounter in your life, then it opens the doors for the other gifts to begin to flow through you for the common good of the body and as his needed. Um, I think I get a little nervous when I get people thinking they control God. And I've seen some, you know, and, and come on, we have... You know, we have uh, we have flakes in the church. Okay, I'll just I'll just say that there are flaky people. Uh, they were flaky in the world. They come to the church. They get still flaky, and and so some of those people have caused a lot of grief because they come in and they get their own ideas about things. They're not founded in the Word, and they kind of take off on whatever feels good or feels right in the moment, and uh, and they cause grief. And so there are those that have gotten real flighty with the Holy Spirit and kind of begin to move in their own uh, their own aspect of that and. And, uh, and so I've, I've seen people try to control this law. You know, I always have this gift of word of knowledge and they try to do that and boy, they get themselves or the prophetic gift, they can, like they can control that. And, you, and I'll tell you what I found. I flow in the area of prophecy. I flow in a lot of those gifts that are there. I, I flow very frequently in, but I can tell you this, I don't control them. Uh, I don't get to turn them on and turn them off in my life. They're as he desires. Um, I'll be in conversation, I'll be in ministry, and then all of a sudden the Lord will, 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 will endow a gift at that moment, whether it's a word of knowledge or word of wisdom, uh, whether it's a prophetic word, and, uh, and it's at that point, and I'm not privy to what he's doing other than he's doing, I just become a vessel for him to do that. Does that make sense? 
So it's not like all of a sudden, well, if you walk in the gift of prophecy, uh, you can look at everybody in the room and start prophesying on everybody. I, I don't believe that God has that level of, of uh, a gift. I, I think some people flow more than others, uh, and some people are very sensitive to the things that God's doing in a room. Um, but, uh, but it is as he needs it. He's the one that controls the in and out of those gifts in our lives. But it is a spiritual gift. And the Holy Spirit, number three, leads us into all truth. Um, actually, in John chapter 16, uh, Jesus says, but when, the, when he, he being the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And, uh, and so uh, there, there is a, a power that w- when we, we have that endowing of the spirit of God, we receive that in our life. Understand these are two different encounters. There's the encounter of you accepting Christ and there's the encounter of you receiving the Holy Spirit. These are two separate encounters in our lives. Uh, and, and, and the Holy Spirit, having that doesn't make necessarily make you more spiritual or righteous or holy, but it does enable you and us to do uh, his work, to flow in the presence of what he's doing. And it does lead us into all truth. And that is one thing that's amazing is we're in the word of God. The Holy Spirit is that which will lead us. Now, that can happen for a believer who's not encountered the Holy Spirit as an infilling or baptism. Because when Jesus comes in your life as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. It's not like, okay, this is a Christian without the Holy Spirit and this is a Christian with. It doesn't work that way. When Christ comes in your life, it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes him into your life. But what happens is we're talking about an infilling of that Spirit. So just a, it's just a pouring over of that infilling in your life that has a, just an endowment for the anointing to flow and for you to be used of God as he wills. And so it does lead us in all truth. We see this actually in the very story of chapter 8 of Acts, continuing on with this sorcerer Simon, who is following Philip and wanting to buy the Holy Spirit, or this power of what he sees happening. And this is Peter's response in verse 20. He says, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will get, forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Now, I have to just say this. Peter knows better. If you ask the Lord to forgive you, he's going to what? Okay, but he's upset. <laughs> There's a little bit of flesh going on here. He's a little angry at this guy. Perhaps God might do it a little bit. I mean, he's kind of he's taking him to the edge. He's calling him out. And, and he says, for I see that you are full of bitterness. This is where that word of knowledge comes in. He's looking beyond the physical, he's seen in the spiritual, and captives to sin. And then, and then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. Now that is a hard issue how his response is. I want to remind you, do you remember when David, back in chapter 11 and, uh, of 2 Samuel, uh, got caught? Uh, Nathan came to him, he had, he had uh, the whole situation with him and Bathsheba, and Uriah, the Hittite, which was one of his mighty men, um, he had him killed because he couldn't get him to go home and pretend it was his son, that she got pregnant, uh, and, and, uh, and he thought he got away with it. And Nathan, the prophet, shows up and says, you are the man, and God's going to tear you, he's going to tear you out. He's going to tear your everything out, man. You're, you're a dead man. It'd be better you not be born. And, and at that moment, David could have responded like, like Simon here. David could have looked and said to Nathan, Nathan, pray to God that what you just said doesn't happen to me. And if he would have done that, he'd have been in real trouble. Because what Simon needed to do was what really showed his heart. Simon didn't need to look to to Peter and say, well, you pray. What Simon needed to do is fall on his face and say, God, forgive me for what I've done. And I think you see a real response here that's amazing. He He didn't repent. There was absolutely no repentance in his response. His repentance is, man, I don't want that to happen to me. Will you do something to make that happen? I want to tell you, that is the difference between a person who has encountered Christ and a person who has encountered the idea of Christ. Because the person who's encountered Christ, our first response is to confess everything and repent and to, and, and, and to get and fall upon his mercy and his grace. But a person who has not encountered Christ but has encountered the idea of Christ it wants somebody else to do something for them so whatever the bad things don't happen. You see the heart issue there? So really what we come down to is Simon wasn't saved. Simon had not received Christ. He was, he was posing as a Christian. We've never seen that before in the church, have we? We've never seen posers of the Christianity. In fact, you know, it says, uh, 
I heard, I heard one statistic that 87% of Americans consider themselves to be Christian, which I can't figure that out because around 87% of this county considers themselves to be atheist or agnostic according to the last census. So I, I don't know where that number is, but I can tell you this. I do not believe that 80%, 87% of America is, 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 are followers of Christ, the disciples. I don't believe that. But there are a lot of people, even those in the church, who are posing uh, and, and they do a very good job. They have the church lingo down. They talk it, but their heart is not right before God. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from. God doesn't care where you've been. And I think that's the message that was in David's, uh, understood that when, he, when, he, when Nathan came to him. God says, I can care less what you've done and where you've been. What I want to know is what are you going to do right now with what I've given you? And that's the only point that God comes to us. He says, listen, okay, I know you're guilty. I know where you've been. I just want to know what are you going to do about it. And when we, when we our hearts are contrite and we turn our hearts towards him, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? And so that, that's all we have to do. That's the amazing thing. And so there are those that come in the room, and you think you're judging yourself by where you've been or what you've done. And God says, I don't care where you've been and what you've done. I just want to know what you're going to do right now. And, uh, because his grace is sufficient. Amen? for our lives. And so we see that the Holy Spirit does lead us into truth. It does bring forth truth in our life. It calls us out. And I would even go as far as to say this, that as a believer, God loves you enough that if you're claiming Christ in your life, he's going to call, he's going to expose your sin. He's going to expose uh, things in your life that shouldn't be. And he will go to the great extents to expose those things. And you say, well, that doesn't fair. Because God says, no, I want you to be free. I don't want you to walk in bondage. And I don't want you to be hijacked or blackmailed by the enemy. I want this stuff to be removed so that you can be useful for me. Number four is the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. And I think this is power. This is very powerful. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. Do you remember when Noah built the ark? I was thinking about this last week. Uh, can you imagine? He didn't have any planers. He didn't have any of the, the tools we have today. He had to start with a tree. And he didn't have the big machine to go in there and grab it and, you know, turn it up and s- shave it down. He had to do all by his own. And it took him how many years? 400 years to build the ark. Can you imagine that? One, one scrape at a time. I mean, that was an amazing process. And then after, can you imagine getting in a boat that's 400 years old at that? I mean, you got to think about this for a moment. That's an amazing task. But, you know, when he, God flooded the earth and him and his family were su- survived and, and he, they found land and all that story had come through, God said to Noah something. He says, I'm going to promise you that I will never flood the earth again. And uh, he says, I'm going to prove. Now, one thing about God, he doesn't just promise. He says, I'm going to give you a sign to show you that I will never do it. And you know what that sign was? The rainbow. He gave us a rainbow. He says, listen, you see this rainbow. That is my reminder that I will never flood the earth that way again. That's a sign from God of his faithfulness and of his promise. Well, the Holy Spirit is also a sign. It's a sign of a guarantee of our names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so Paul says this actually in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 3. I love, if you ever need encouragement, if you ever, anybody here ever been depressed or discouraged? You know what? I encourage you to read uh, Ephesians chapter 1. It'll bless the socks off of you. It's an incredible. Listen, the, the, I'll just give you the first, the first uh, verse 3. It says this, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, right there, you can go home and say, hey, that was good. Uh, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm uh, with Christ. You say, well, okay, what are those blessings? Well, he lists those out in verses 4 on. In fact, verses 4 through uh, 12, he lists those, or 14, he lists all those blessings, the spiritual blessings. I mean, I mean, incredible. Uh, and if that's not enough for you, go to Deuteronomy 28 and look at the first 17 or 14 verses of that. And he'll talk about, he's how, how God says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and follow all his commands, I will give you today. That right there, you can stop and go, wow, I need today. But he goes on, he says, you'll always be on top, never on the bottom. You will lend to many and borrow from none. I mean, he go, you'll be blessed when you go in, blessed when you go out. Those are powerful words that God gave the Israelites. Well, Paul comes and he lays out these spiritual blessings that are in the heavenly realms. And it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful study to walk through in chapter one of Ephesians to just walk through what are the blessings that God has blessed you with and that he wants to endow upon you. But he gets down to verse 13. This is what he says in those blessings. He says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. 
you're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So the Holy Spirit coming in your life, that infilling in your life, is like the rainbow was for Noah. It is you for your faith to be reminded that God has already written your names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And just the Holy Spirit in your life, that, that, in, that endowment, is there as a sign to remind you that you are guaranteed, you, the deposit has been made for heaven for you. And, and, and that fulfillment of what Jesus said, that deposit is there as a guarantee of, of, of our inheritance. And uh, that's powerful. Um, he goes on, and actually, John, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, he continues, and he comes back to this, and he says this, Paul says this to the Ephesians, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. For with him you were sealed with a day, for the day of, uh, of redemption. So it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. And so, again, that whole point that the Holy Spirit in your life is also a sign of the, of the inheritance of what God has for you. So when you're walking in the gifts of the Spirit, when you're flowing in those gifts, that is only a sealed or a deposit of what is yet to come and what God has inheritance for you. Amen? And I mean, that's a powerful thing when you really think about it. So, and I think sometimes we, we kind of limit what the Holy Spirit really wants to do, but understanding that as we talk about this is important. So um, that is there. So the question, and I, again, in closing here, I, I am towards the end of this. Uh, how are we doing? We're doing pretty good on time. Yeah, look at that. Uh, actually, are we, are we over time? I don't know. Um, so... Uh, let me ask you, this is kind of where I want to leave you with this morning real quick, is how do we receive the Holy Spirit? And I think let's, you know, um, I, I was telling somebody last week, I, I don't like to be sold. You like to be sold? When I go into a car lot, you want to turn me off is try to sell me a car. I don't want you to sell me. Uh, when I go to conferences, I'm a Gen Xer. So when I go to conferences and they have workshops, I walk to the workshop facilitator of every workshop and I'll ask, this is the question I ask them. I'll walk up to the front and I'll say, I just want to know one question. How much of this workshop is selling me on, on, on the workshop and how much is giving me the tools of what this workshop is about? And inevitably, the workshop, oh, well, it's like 50% selling. I'm like, if I'm showing up and voting with my feet to show up, why are you trying to sell me when I'm already here? Just give me the tools I need to take. That's kind of that's where I'm at, right? So I, I don't want to be sold. I, I, want, I want to give me the tools. And I think sometimes we talk about the Holy Spirit, but what are the tools? How do we take this, this idea of the Holy Spirit? And you say, well, I want this in my life. You say, Pastor, I, listen, I have Jesus. I, I am in love with him. I'm completely uh, just enamored with him in my life, but I want the Holy Spirit. I want this part. So what do I need to do to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm going to give you a few things uh, here to look at. And, and, uh, and so kind of breaking down. And first, I just kind of, I do want to take a couple of verses to sell it to you in a sense, just to remind you that this is not a new concept in, in, in Acts, that this is actually from the beginning. So just to remind you of this, John the Baptist talked about this. Just to go back, to kind of give in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I baptize you with water, but he, being Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So that, that term goes all the way before Jesus started his ministry. We also know that Jesus himself talked about it in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, when he said, listen, um, he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the, the, the gift my father has promised, which you heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that, that term Jesus is saying, you, these, he's talking to saved people here. He's talking to people who have names have been, you know, in the Lamb's book of life. And he says, listen, this is about to come. And then in Luke uh, 24, 49, Jesus said this, I'm going to send you, uh, you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed from the power and high. So this is not a new concept. This is something Jesus is saying, this is coming. And so when it came, the church picked this up and it impacted the church in a powerful way. It's what ex the church exploded when the Holy Spirit began to be flow through the body because you know what? People who had found Christ became bold witnesses of that. You say, well, why do I need the Holy Spirit in your life? Because you know what? I believe God wants to increase your boldness in your faith if for no other reason that you'll have a boldness. I had a guy, uh, Rick Peterson, when I was in high school, uh, got saved in our youth group. In fact, he, he came to, he got saved. He was going to commit suicide, and he had a shotgun in his mouth. His parents were gone, and, 
and he had decided he, he was just going to give up life, and, and he had the shotgun in his life, and, he's, and he, I don't know why he was watching TV, but he was flipping through the channels as he get I don't know, he, maybe he didn't see what he was going to miss before he, he pulled the trigger, and he ran across the 700 Club, and, uh, and, and the message came out, and he decided not to shoot himself. He gave his heart to Christ. His parents came home and said, told my dad, said, you need to go talk to the youth pastor, and actually, the youth pastor was my youth pastor, is the pastor of the church in Pasco, where we do the men's conference, Daryl Johnson, and he says, I want you to go meet with him, and so Rick told me one time, Rick and I got pretty close, but he told me, he says, he says yeah, he says, uh, he was a little older than I was, he says, I, I got there, and he says, I, I couldn't go in, so I smoked a joint just to calm myself down on the outside of the church uh, before I can go in, right, and so he goes inside, and, and, and but Rick, God used him in an incredible way. From that moment on, Jesus began to, everywhere he went, people were getting saved. And um, it was just incredible. He would, uh, incredible what God would do. And we were in Jamaica together down doing mission trip, and we were rooming together. And I was frustrated because when I got to Jamaica, the first day I was there, I led one guy to Christ. And, uh, and, and I remember coming back to the room, and I was pretty excited about the one guy that found Jesus. And he had 20 people he had led to Christ in the street. And I was like, oh, man, that's awesome. I want that. And every night he would say this to me. He says, you know, Eric, he says, I can't believe what God does in my life. I just wonder, if I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with, I wonder how many more would come to Christ. He would say this every night we were in Jamaica. And every night I'd come back, and I still had the one for the first day. And he had like 30 or 30 more, you know, the next day. 20 or 30 more the next day. It was just, he was a, just a powerhouse. And I think he's a four-square pastor now, but he's just an awesome guy. And, uh, and, and so, you know, he, he wanted that boldness. He had the boldness. He's like, what would the Spirit do? And I think later on he did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it kind of moved in his life, and he was pretty excited about that. And, uh, but but I think it's something that we should, we should want and desire that is there. So you say, well, how do you receive it? Three words. I'm just going to give you three simple words. These are simple words. Okay, number one is ask. We talked about last week, you know, you don't have, James says, because you don't ask. When you do ask, you ask for the wrong motives. But, but it's ask. Uh, Peter replied in J- Acts chapter 2 when the, when, they, when the day of Pentecost came down and, and the, the Spirit of God moved upon them. And they're coming out, and everybody thinks they're drunk. And he says, listen, it's only 9 in the morning. And he preaches, and it says 3,000 came to the Lord, right? He preached the, the message. And listen to what he says. They go, How, what was, the, the crowd said, what must we do? And this is coming right out of the upper room. And this is what he says. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Now, he's talking about physical baptism there. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of, the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he goes, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all three are right there. I mean, coming out of there, he says, listen, you need to repent, you need to be baptized, and you know what? The Spirit of God is going to, boom, come down upon you. And it's like, that. It, was like it, it was a given. I mean, he was like the first, this is the first Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit message right there. And it says that the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. And we know that 3,000 came to the Lord that day. So you say, well, um, uh, which, 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 is, which, is, which is amazing. Um, we also know, uh, it says, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but eagerly desire the greater gifts, Paul says, and I will show you the most excellent way. Um, I got ahead of my notes here, I'm sorry. Uh, so Jesus said in Luke 11, he says, ask and what? Seek, seek and knock. So, so ask. So, so a lot of people have never received it because they've never asked for it. They didn't know to ask for it. It's kind of like when Paul and, uh, or Peter and, uh, or excuse me, Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 19 said, hey, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, dude, we, we, we received the baptism in Jesus' name. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. They said, well, that's easy. Just ask for it. And so I would say this. If you want to receive this gift in your life, number one is ask. And that's pretty simple. And if you ask, uh, that's there. Number two is surrender. And, uh, and, that's where, and that's where we see this point of, of going beyond the asking is there needs to be a surrender in our lives. And I've had people that have prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Anybody here ever prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I've had people who prayed for it and not received it. In fact, for me, it was for six years as a kid. Uh, I had seen, I grew up in a a similar God church. I grew up around Pentecostalism. And it was something I wanted in my own life, and I didn't receive it for many years. And, uh, and I was frustrated. I had, I had the elders laying hands on me, man. I remember one time in the back room, we had a back room off the side of our sanctuary. Uh, and, and I remember I had, I think, I don't know, seven or eight elders back there. And I thought they were, I, I thought I was going to have to call the ambulance because I thought I was going to die. They were pushing down on me so hard. Uh, and there was like 12 hands and they were pushing and I couldn't breathe for about 10 minutes. I'm like, ah! 
and they thought I was speaking in tongues. I was just grasping for help. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen it go bad. I've seen it go south. I've seen everything, you know. And, uh, but had not received that. that I didn't know why. And, and I remember my cousin, who was like three years younger than me, all of a sudden he called me one day and says, hey, Eric, I received it. He was like nine. He received it. And I'm like, oh. And I was so frustrated. And I was like, why? But I think th- sometimes people don't receive it because they need to surrender things in their life. If you have continued sin, sometimes that can hold out. Uh, and if there's things in your life that's holding out, so sometimes it's just like, it's a time to clean out. I mean, we can have Christ in our lives, but not give him every area of our lives, and we can hold on to certain areas, and those can become a deterrent, because God is saying, listen, I want this removed so that I can come in and flow, and so that can be a hindrance that is there, and I'm not saying if you don't receive the Holy Spirit that you're in sin, that, that would be a mistake, because uh, I don't think I was in great sin as, you know, as a six-year-old kid seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It just didn't happen for me and, um, until, until, until later years. And so, so um, and I think actually the number one reason I think people don't receive it, that, that seek it, is they're seeking it for the wrong motive. And what I mean by that is I find a lot of people are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues because man has put that idea in their head, not because God has put it there. And that's really what happened to me. It was when I stopped seeking because man was telling me I needed to seek it. And I started seeking because God said, now is the time. And that was when, that was when it happened for me. And, and, that, and that, that's, that gift began to flow. And so, um, so just because it's there, just make sure it's God putting it in your heart, not man. And the motives are correct that is there. Uh, that's why it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. So it's real simple, just getting his presence and removed. The, so, so, so ask, surrender, and the last is simple, is to believe. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it'll be yours. That's pretty powerful. In fact, that was the argument the 700 Club had and said, this is why when you pray, tell them to receive it. It's because it says, hey, ask, receive it. And, uh, but believing and just saying, listen, Lord, I believe that it's here. Now remember, our faith, and I've talked about this, is not in our believing necessarily. Our faith is in his greatness. Uh, but we do believe because he's great. It's because of who he is that we are able to lay a hold of that and say, wow. And so we say, hey, believe it. Lord, I want this gift in my life. I want the first fruits of this gift. Um, and uh, in there, you know, um, for years ago in my ministry, I have to tell you, I have been probably the biggest knucklehead in ministry known to man. Uh, I, there, I look back, I look back over the last, you know, 30 years, 30, 35 years of ministry, and man, am I ashamed of myself and some of the positions I held. When my wife and I, we were kids when we went into ministry, Man, we were born to be poor. That was the focus of our lives. You know, it was like we're going to have nothing, and we're going to move in life with nothing because we're all God. You know, I might as well have been a Catholic monk. Okay, you know, I just that was kind of where I started. And and it wasn't until later that I realized that Lord, guys, he says, he says God's like, do you think I want to bless you a little bit? And I'm like, well, I think you love me. Maybe you want to, you know. And it's like all of a sudden begin to move and say, no, wait a minute, God does want me to walk. And so I think my my self esteem or whatever it was years ago, and I I found these noble things. Uh, I thought were noble, but they were just downright stupid. Um, one of the passages that really affected me early on in my ministry was the uh, story of Ruth. Um, how many know the story of Ruth? Uh, she was a Moabite, and uh, she decides to, her husband dies, who was a Jew, and, uh, the, and the, her wife, the mother-in-law decides to go back to, uh, back to Bethlehem. I think it was Bethlehem. Uh, and, uh, was it Bethlehem? No, it was... Uh, it hit me and said, it's the bread, where bread was. And my head just kind of went blank on it. But she goes back, and that's when she finds uh, Mordecai, is his mom's cousin. Was it Mordecai? Did I get that wrong? Mordecai was, uh, Boaz, thank you. I get, the, I get these names wrong. Just, so Boaz, in, in this whole process. But what ends up coming back, she's looking to, to kind of feed their family, and so she goes out to glean the fields. Now, this is what hit me. And Boaz notices her. And she asked, just of her favor, can I go behind your your, your, your pickers, and can I, whatever's left over, can I just glean for that and take it home? And I, I grabbed a hold of that years ago, and I, I, this, this was a problem for me. I had to, the Lord had to really break me out of this. And, and I had this noble hit in my head, in the word. I saw this, and I thought, you know, that was really powerful. And I remember I started praying during that season, Lord, if I could just glean the leftovers, if I could just glean the leftovers of the field, that was kind of, I kind of went in this mode of ministry for years. If I could just have, that would be enough for me. If I could glean the leftovers, that would be enough for me. And I really settled there in my ministry. 
Uh, and again, remember, I'm kind of a knucklehead coming from born to be poor. You know, if I could just glean the leftovers. I thought that was pretty noble. You know, it seemed spiritually noble to me. So I was kind of on that, on that quest. And it was, a, it was the church I was at uh, about 20 years ago. Was, uh, we had gone to a youth conference with the Assemblies of God, and I had all African-American kids. And I took them. In fact, we, my kids showed up. I showed up with 30, 40 kids, and they were the only black kids there out of 5,000 kids. And, and I became a little more aware of the cultural, you know, and, and the, that whole thing. I, you don't think about that until you're kind of in that mode. And my kids were staying really close to me, and they were staying really close together. And we were up at Northwest College, and, and, um, and I was realizing, I didn't notice it at first, but then I realized they were really kind of, you know, kind of clean, clean, because like, man, we kind of feel out of place here. These are all white, white folk here, and what do we do? And so we got to Overlake Christian, uh, Overlake Church, the old Overlake uh, uh, the new, actually, it's the new Overlake building. And um, we were sitting on the side. Uh, my kids were kind of on the back on the side of the sanctuary. And they did an altar call, and the Holy Spirit just came down in the service, and it was powerful. I mean, it was one of those things that God was like, the, the tug was there, the anointing was there. And, and I, I, in my, I'm looking over at my kids, and my kids aren't moving. They're not moving at all. They're like, hey, we're good back here. You know, we're going to get trampled by all these white people. And, uh, you know, just, we'll stay here. We're, we're safe. You know, half of them were inner city kids anyway. And I'm like, oh, Lord, if we could just have the leftovers. I'll never forget this. I'm standing there thinking I'm spiritual. If we could just have the leftovers. And the Holy Spirit took a two-by-four and just started beating the snot out of me and said, Where? who told you that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he says, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, and I, I started quoting this, you know, back to the scripture on there. And he says, Who, I didn't tell you this. I have, tell me, show me where I've told you to go for the leftovers. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm standing there. My kids are just like, they're, you know, kind of hanging in here. And he says, I've called you to the first fruits. You need to get off your rear end and get with the program. And that was just, God was kind of pulling me together. And I remember looking at my kids and I said, what are you doing here? And they're like, we're just trying to survive, you know? And I says, you get down there, man. Get to the front. Push through that crowd. Get My kids, man, they stormed down and they got in the front. And God just came down. And I said, you get the first fruits of what God has. But I learned something that day. That I'm not settling for the left or I'm not settling for second. Because God never called me to second. And I would say this to you. God has not called you to anything less than the first of what he has. His blessing, his power, his goodness, his favor, all of it, the first fruits of it, is available. And he's desiring to pour it. It is as if, it is if angels are standing over our heads right now with barrels of his blessing, barrels of his power and of his goodness. And they're just waiting for us to say, Lord, I will receive it. I want the best that you have to just all of a sudden pour it out on our lives. But maybe you're like me. Maybe you've been like me, kind of sat back and said, I'll just settle for the leftover. And I'll tell you, I've never done that from that day on. That changed me. I said, Lord, I will never do that again. I will never settle for what, what is second. I want the best at what you have. I will be the first of what you have for my life. And that, that, that changed my ministry. It changed my life in so many ways. And so I just encourage you this morning, as we kind of close with this this morning, I'm going to have Ben come up and, and play in closure, I want to give opportunity for you this morning to receive. Can I do that? I do believe that God wants to pour out. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. That is an encounter that hasn't happened, and you would like to receive that. I want to give opportunity for that today. I don't want to just walk away from it. Last night, we kind of came to that moment and said, here it is, and the Lord said, not now, but this morning, the Lord has really put my heart. No, we need to have that opportunity, and maybe you're here, and I just have you close your eyes right now and bow your heads. I don't want you looking around because as we do this, it's not about show. It's not about anyone else. It's about you. And if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor, I would like you to pray for me. Because you know one thing that's interesting about the receiving of the Holy Spirit? In every of the encounters in the, Acts pro, uh, in, in the Acts stories of the early church, it said when they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And so there was this, uh, this impartation, if you will, of the Holy Spirit being endowed. And if that's you this morning, nobody's looking around, I want you to come on up here. I want to pray for you. And just, just come on up right now. Just, don't, just leave your seat and come on up here. And I want to give opportunity to pray for you. If, you, if, if you've all received the power of the Holy Spirit, maybe you're, you're just ready for that. I want to give opportunity this morning. Because I want you to know God is not wanting you to take a second seat in what he has. He wants you to step into the first fruits this morning of what he has for you. He loves you so much. Just as that song, that reckless song, he will 
climb the highest mountain. David said, it's Psalms 138, where can I go? In 139 Psalms, where can I go to escape you? Where can I go to hide from you? He says, I go to the top of the mountains and you are there. I go to the lowest valleys and you are there. I go in the deepest caves and you are there. Your hand is not too small to reach me. And God's hand is not too short this morning to reach into your life. And so I'll just ask one more time, and uh, I'm not going to belabor it, but if you'd like to receive the Holy Spirit this morning, I want to pray for you.
you need to go, we understand. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. I pray the Lord's favor would just continue to flow with you this week. And uh, his goodness flow in your lives. Amen. Uh, reminder, we do have a home group at Bob's. Those are part of that home group. We'd like to come. Uh, Bob Vertifay, Bob and Terry's. That is tonight at 5 o'clock. And those are welcome to, to come and be a part of that. Let me know if you're interested in coming. And uh, it's a great time of fellowship. Uh, just follow John home and he'll get you there. And uh, just